Hi guys, what's up? Um, my name is Alon. I'm a team lead for Wix.com. It's my second time here at Scala by the Bay and I'm really excited. And today I'm going to talk to you about bytecode. Well, actually the bytecode Scala generates. It's going to be a low level talk, so if you don't understand or can't like, follow all the details, the slides are available and you can ask me later on. But just try and get a hold of the principle we're going to see here and try to have fun. <laughs> Okay, so, sorry. I have set. Okay. okay, sorry about that. So, we all use case classes objects, lazy definition, we pass functions as values, and we do other really cool stuff that Scala allows us. But those things do not exist on the JVM. So how can they, they be supported by the JVM? Sorry, those things are not supported by Java, but how are they implemented on top of the JVM? So our agenda for today is we're gonna see a bit what bytecode is and what's the structure of a class file. And later on, we're gonna see how the different Scala features I mentioned earlier are implemented on top of the JVM. So, what is bytecode? And is there such a thing as Scala bytecode? Well, actually, there is no such a thing as Scala bytecode. The Scala compiler compiles the Scala files to class files the same way the Java compiler compiles Java files to class files. At the end, it's all about class files in the JVM. Java uses Java C to compile its source files and Scala uses Scala C. The JVM is agnostic to the language that created the bytecode. <coughs> so, what is actually bytecode? It is a set of low-level instructions to be executed by the JVM. There are about 200 of those instructions, each one between one to two bytes in size. I add AA load, AA store of just a few of those examples. In order to compute the instructions we saw before, bytecode employs an assembly-like register and stack. There are two stacks. We have the local stacks, used to hold variables, and the operand stack, used to hold values of fields, functions, and binary operations, such as plus, minus, multiply, and things like that, operate in two parameters. So, the tools we are going to use during this session are Scala C and Java P. The Java P command allows us to disassemble a class file and look at its structure and signatures. And the Scala C command allows us to see the different phases our code goes through in the compilation phase by the Scala compiler. So if you ever felt dissatisfied or angry at the Scala compiler, we shouldn't be because it does a lot of work for us compiling our code. It actually does 25 things for us. If we would run Scala C minus X show phases, we will get a list of 25 steps. Each one has a step name, an ID, and a small description of what it does. Those are all the steps our code is, being, is going through in the compilation phase by the Scala compiler. Let's quickly go over just a few of them that, we give, that, we, that are going to be relevant later on. Number one is the parser. It parses our souls into ASTs. Number four is the typer. It adds type to our code. Number six, super accessors. Add super accessors in trait and nested classes. Number 12, specialized. Number 16, lazy vowels, and so on, and so on, and so on, until we get to finally number 24, which is the JVM, where the bytecode is actually being generated. So let's see a small example of two of those phases. If we have a small, simple, sorry. If we have a small, simple class, class full, with some vowels, and a small method called Wibble, 
and we're going to try and see the phases it's going through after we compile it. So after the first step, after the parser step, we can see a few differences in the, compile, in the code that is going through the compilation. So first of all, you can notice that the class is now inside a package empty, as we did not declare a package in the original file. You can also see that init that acts like a pseudo constructor has been added. The plus operation assigned to k has been expanded to the method plus. And the for comprehension we saw before, for inside of the label, has been transformed and expanded to a map call. So this is after phase number one. If we would look and the same code after phase number four, the typer, we're gonna see that types are now assigned. Notice all the ints and the string bolded that we've been added. For example, our val i is type int, and so do other vals in depth in the class. We can also see the synthetic methods added to access the value of i, j, and k. Def i, def j, and def k. Those were just two examples of what the phases of code is being going through until a class file is being created. So let's have a look of what is inside a class file and what is the structure of a class file. Let's say we have another class, a class regular polygon. It takes one parameter in the constructor, a number of sides. It has one method get perimeter which does a simple calculation, multiplying the side length by the side, this num side. If we would run java p minus p minus v on the class file, we'll get this output. The minus p and minus v flags are used to produce the more verbose output, and the minus p flag is used to also display all the private methods and fields of the class. So if we would go over this huge file, this is not a, even the entire file, this is just the beginning, we'll see that every class file has the same structures on the JVM and has a few sections in it. So the first one is the system info, which is a metadata about the class itself, when it was changed, and how many bytes it has, and so on. Another thing is the version. It's not very interesting, it's just the class version and the format. An interesting, really interesting and important part is something called, and scary as well as hell, is called the constant pool. So what is the constant pool and what does it contain? First of all, a bit of background. The development, of C, the development cycle of C++ applications includes the compilation and linkage stages. The development cycle for Java skips an explicit linkage stage because linkage happens at runtime. So when a method or a field is referred to, is referred to, the JVM searches the actual address of the method or field on the memory by using the runtime constant pool. It is a table of all references needed by the linker and it contains entries of different types. Let's try and explain one of these records. Okay. So let's say our class file has a constant integer. Let's say val x equals 365. And we would run Java P and we get the output on the left, which is x 03000016D. This is the bytecode. If you want Java P, we'll get more of a human readable form. And we'll say this line, pound 14 equals integer 365. Let's try to explain this structure. So the first byte of each entry is a numeric tag indicating the type of the entry. The remaining bytes provide information about the value of the entry. The number of bytes and rules for their interpretation depends on the byte indicating the first byte. So in our case, the first byte is x03, identifying the entry type in the JVM, which is a constant integer. This informs the linker that the next four bytes contains the value of the integer. So you would guess by now that the next four bytes, 00016D, 
are actually 365 in hexadecimal. So that's an example of how would a constant integer be represented in the constant form. Let's see another example of the same function, only now with a string. So a string will have two representations in the constant form, two entries in the constant form. The first entry will be type constant string, and the second entry of type constant UTF-8. The entry of type constant UTF-8 will contain the actual UTF representation of the string volume. The entry type of constant string contains a reference to the constant UTF-8 entry. You can see the reference just by pound 25 type string, and there's a reference to the line above with the UTF-8, which is the actual value. So those are just two simple types, int and string, that we saw. The more complex types will have the more and more complex representation in the constant pool, but the structure will remain the same. It will be a definition of a type, the value, and a reference to a subtype. So, if we would continue looking at the file from before, this is the next uh, structure of the class file. We're going to see there is a few more, a few more sections. The class file also contains a field table that, that contains information about each field defined in the class. These are references to the constant pool entries that describe the field's name and type, as well as access control flags and other relevant data. You can see the control flags, private, final, on, on, top of the, on the top. The top. Um, another thing that we have in the constant pool is a method table. A method table represents a method table presents in the class file. However, in addition to name and type information for each non-abstract method, it also contains the actual bytecode to instructions to be executed by the JVM, as well as the data structures used by the method stack frame. So this is the actual code that is going to be run by the JVM when we're going to run this file. This is the actual instruction sets. Let's zoom in on the get perimeter function that we saw before. Okay. So let's try and see what's going on here. We saw that the get perimeter function for before does a simple thing. It just multiplies the number of sides by the, the perimeter. Okay, so each instructions start with a one byte code with a one byte opcode identifying the JVM instructions followed by zero or more instructions operate to be operated on depending on the format of the specification of the specific instructions these are typically either constant values or references into the constant pool for other parameters Java P helpfully transformed the bytecode into, into a human readable form, displaying the offset or position of the first byte of the instruction within the code, and also the human name of the function. You can see it on the right. And the value of, of the operand if it exists. Note that operands that are displayed with pound signs, such as pound 23, are once again referenced to entries in the constant pool as we saw before. So let's look even further on just one line. And we can see the actual uh, multiplication line, sign length, times this number of sides. And those, this is the instruction set that actually invokes the code. Let's see a demo of what's going on. So, in this crazy animation, there's a few things going on. I'm going to describe the instruction sets that are, that are being called and what does each one do. So, dload1 pushes the object reference from slot1 into the local variable. This, uh, sorry. Dload1 pushes the object reference from slot1 of the local variable onto the operand stack. In this case, it's the argument slide length. A load 0 pushes the object reference at slot 0 to the local variable into the table operand stack as well. Invoke virtual 31 executes the instant method number of sides. 
invoke virtual pops the top operand of the stack to identify from what class it must call the method. Once the method returns, it results, it, the result is pushed back onto the stack. ITD2 pops the integer value of the stacks, convert it to a floating point format, and pushes it back onto the stack. The stack now contains the floating point result on top, followed by the value signed like argument that was passed to the method. And finally, Dumu pops these two values from the stack, performs floating point multiplication, and pushes the result back onto the stack. So, Hopefully the hard part of this talk is over, and now we can do some more fun stuff. Now that we understand the basic flow of what is happening inside of the JVM and the compilation phase of our code and how it is actually being run and how the bytecode is actually being run, we can go back and see the cool features of Scala that we saw before and check how they're actually implemented on. So let's start from the beginning. If we have two classes, one in Scala, one in Java, both doing the same thing. And we will run Java P on them. We'll see a few differences. The Scala class is public by default, implementing the Scala object in addition to extending the Java object. The Scala constructor is created and is public by default. The Java main method must be declared static. Another example is that we now take a simple class in Scala and check out the val in the constructor. So we can now see that for each field in the Scala class, currently only the name field, a field and its getter method are generated. The field is private and final while the method is public. If we would replace the val from before with a var, we're gonna see small difference. The field's final modifier is dropped, since now it's a var and you can play with it. And the setter method is added for us automatically. If any val or var defined inside the class body, then the corresponding private field and accessor methods are created as well. And initialized properly upon instance creation. So objects, so we all have objects, but how are they implemented on? So if we have a class, a small object config with one parameter of val home deal, and we try to compile the code, what will be actually be created? We're gonna see that from config scala, two class files will be created, config and config dollar class. One of these two, what's inside these two? So the config class is just a decorator for the syntactic config dollar class that embeds the singleton functionality. All it does is basically call on line three invoke virtual 18, that you're gonna see on the next slide. The config dollar class actually consists of the logic of the method and has the following. The, th the syntactic model dollar, sorry, the syntactic variable model w to which other object access the singleton functionality on the top. It's a public reference to the singleton object. The static initializer, also known as the class initializer, a getter method for the static field, home dear. In this case, it's just one method. If a singleton has more fields, more methods will be added as well. If it's a, var if it's a virus, more setter methods will be added as well. And it also has a private method, config dollar, used to initialize model dollar, model that model dollar and set its field to default values. So you would think such small code would produce small code on the JVM, but these two lines actually produce this entire thing. Okay, next one are traits. So we have a trait, which two method is similar and is not similar. It's supposedly very simple. Once again, if we examine what's its, what are the class files that are being generated, we will see two classes, similarity and similarity dollar class. Similarity class is a regular Java interface. The interface declaring both methods. As we saw before in the top, public abstract boolean is similar and the same for is not similar. 
similarity class providing the default implementations. When a class implements these traits and call the method is not similar, the Scala compiler generates the bytecode instruction invoke interface. You can see it in line two, invoke <coughs> interface, which calls the is similar method. Which calls to call the static method provided by the commoning class. We can see the call to is similar is in line two, and by calling reference pound 13. And pound 13 is once again, you can imagine, is a reference to the constant pool where the is similar method is defined. We can also see the jump condition at line 7 and 10, which are implementing the not logic operation. So if we have several traits and we want to implement them all, what would happen on the JVM? So let's say we have a small a calculator trait with addition, division, multiplication, and subtraction operation, and we would like to create a class that extends them all of them, what will happen? Well, actually, the compiler will create two files for each trait, just as we saw before. This is the additional operation trait that we are looking at. And we can see in the same pattern again, the additional operation with the public interface. In the, up, in, the, in the top, and the actual implementation in the addition operation dollar class, which holds the logic. And this is the same class once it's, it has implemented all the methods. And you can see the delegation. Each time you would like to call one of the traits we are implementing, there's a delegation using the static class that has been created down below. So, let's talk about something interesting. If we have a class person and one method M, and we would like to reference that method in, in three ways, in a val, in a var, and in a def. How are, how are each of these reference M constructed? And when does M get executed on? Let's examine the class panel and see what's going on. So don't be scared, that's a lot of code, but it's quite simple. Let's first take a higher look of what's going on on the screen. So on the top, as usual, once again, we have the constant pool with the M fields definitions. M, we have M, M1, M2 on the left, M1, M2, and M, M1, M2 on the left, and we have M, M3 and the constructor on the right. This is M3, this is the constructor. So, in the constant pool, we see the reference to the method M is stored at index 30, right? Index 30, method ref, person M. In the constructor code on the right, over here, we see this, this, method, this method is invoked twice during initialization with the instruction invoke virtual appearing first at byte offset 11 and then offset 19. The first invocation is followed by the instruction put field 22, which assigns the result of this method to the field M1, referred by index pound 22 in the constant pool. So this is just a delegation. We are calling M and assigning it inside of M1. The second invocation is followed by the same pattern, this time assigning the value, of the f the value to the field M2 at index pound 24 in the constant pool. In other words, assigning a method to a variable defining with a val over var only assigns the result of the method to the variables. It does not call it every time from the beginning. We can also see that M1 and M2 got getters in order to access the values of this file, or the, of these parameters. In case of M2, we can also see a setter method M2 equal int is created, which behaves just like any other setter at overriding the value in the field. M2 is a var, meaning it gets a setter automatically on the, on the bytecode. However, using the keyword def gives us a different result. Rather than fetching a field to return, the method M3 
also includes the instruction invoke virtual authority. That is, each time this method is called, it calls M and, return, and returns the result of the method. So this is quite a simple example, but it actually shows us what we already knew. We already knew this behavior, but it's super cool because you can actually see on the bytecode level how this is being done. To make this even interesting, well, depends who you ask, is what happens if we add a lazy to the game? How are lazy being implemented on top of Scala? And what happens in the bytecode? So lazy, as you think, the value of field, currently lazy is on field M4, which is the lazy definition, the lazy assignment of the, of the method. And we know that M4 is not calculated until it is needed. So the special private method M4 lazy compute is produced to calculate the lazy value and the field bitmap zero to track its state. Why do we need to track its states? Well, the method M4 checks if the field value is zero, indicating that M4 has not been initialized yet. In which case, M4 lazy compute is invoked, populating M4 and returning its value. The private method also sets the value of bitmap zero to one, so, the, so that the next time M4 is called, it will skip invoking the initialization method and instead simply return the value of M4. The bytecode Scala produces here is designed to be both thread safe and effective. To be thread safe, the lazy compute method uses the monitor enter, monitor exit pair of instructions. Basically, we are locking the monitor. The method remains effective since the performance overhead of this synchronization only occurs on the first read of the lazy values. Another interesting question is how many lazy values can one class have? So we already know that we need at least one bit to indicate the state of the lazy value. So if there are no more than 32 lazy values, a single integer field can be tracked them, and you can track them by adding a bit mask to the operation. But if there are more than 32 lazy values, another bit mask will be added, and so on, and so on, and so on. So the last thing we are going to talk about before lunch is functions. If we, if we have an object with some basic functions that work on primitives, concat and strings, some summing, some doubles, some longs, and so on, what's going on with them? So if you would look at the concat function again and see what goes on under the hood, we can see a few things. It's a final class extending abstract function to, which takes the parameter of string, string, string. Meaning we're getting two strings and we are returning a string. Notice the plus operation on the string has been replaced with the string builder. So if you are still using explicitly replacing classes with string builders, you can drop it and the compiler will just do it for you. This is a more interesting example. What happens when you look at sum int function? So sum int takes two integers and returns another integer. And we would, we would expect it to extend something abstract function, integer, integer, integer. But ex 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 and besides that, it does something different. For some reason, it extends something called abstract function to MCIIISP. Well, what the heck is that? <laughs> well, it turns out uh, it's something called specialized implementation generated by the Scala compiler. Let's explain it shortly. The MCIISP at the name end is telling us that the function returning one int and receiving two. The SP and the end indicating it's a special type, specialized type. So what are specialized type? Specialized type are a feature that allows you to generate separate version of generic classes for primitive types, thus avoiding boxing. In most cases, really improving the performance. The only specialized functions in the Scala are functions two to function zero. 
The rest of them, functions 3 to functions 22, are not specialized. If you didn't understand by now, the number of function 0 2 indicates how many parameters are we taking. Uh, what are, what is, why did we saw this different MCIISP? Well, there is a correlation between the Java type and the Scala value type and the Java primitive and the type character. So if we have a function from an int and a double to a boolean, it will be specialized to an abstract function to MCZID. Just go and check the type int, double, and boolean, and you will get the name. Another thing that if we actually try and decompile function 2 of the Scala standard library, we're going to get a huge, 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 huge list of all the permutations available. You can see all the different names, ZDD, DDD, LDD, and so on. Basically, the Scala compiler tries to improve performance by in advance generating all the permutation it can do with primitives. So partially applied functions. We know that we can provide to functions less parameters than they expect and create a partially applied function by using placeholders. How does it actually work? So if we have three functions, concat, hello, and hello xband, the, con the concat function takes three parameters and concats them. We can create a partially applied function for it by just pressing one string and two placeholders. And the same for the hello xband. How does the Scala compiler support this feature? Well, the Scala compiler will generate a new class for each function that we create with this technique. This is our concat function, the first one that we saw here. This is the hello function, which passes one string and two placeholders. Notice the object x and object x2 down in the end. And it's also the name partially applied. And this is the hello x bank function. The same thing with object x3. <coughs> so function has values. In Scala, functions are first class citizens. We can pass them around to as values to other parameters, to other functions, or to other values as well. So if we have a small class, printer class, with only one field in output, and we would like to use it and pass to it an anonymous function, all it does it takes string s and prints s. That's it. What will happen under the hood? So again, we will see four class being generated. The hello class and hello dog class are not that interesting. Those are just the wrapper object, the wrapper class that were created because we are using an object here of it hello. The more interesting class are the anonymous function one and the printer class. So the hello class, as I said before, is just a wrapper class whose main method simply calls the hello dollar main. This is the hello class and it contains the real implementation of the main method. The method creates a new printer. It then creates hello dollar anonymous function one, which you're going to see in the next slide, which contains our anonymous functions s to print s, that we saw before. The printer is initialized with the object as the output field, and the field is then loaded into the step to be executed with the operand hello. This is the hello dollar anonymous function. We can <coughs> see that it extends Scala function one by implementing the apply method. Actually, it creates two apply methods, the one on the top and the one on the bottom. One wrapping the other, which together performs type checking in case the input is changed and execute the anonymous function printing the input with print len. And this is the main hello class. We can say offset 21, the execution of the anonymous function is triggered by a call to its apply object method. 21, we're just going to invoke the interface and call the apply method that we saw before. And from the printer perspective, it, well basically for, for this class, it's behaved just the same as for any other value block. The anonymous function view is treated just the same as any other value. 
it is stored in a class field output, and the getter output is created. The only difference is that the variable must now implement the Scala interface, Scala function one. So lunch is almost here, only to conclude what we saw. We've seen how Scala compiles several implicit and function programming features into sophisticated Java bytecode instructions. We also now have the tools to explore it ourselves. Basically, just write a small object or a small class file, run Scala C or Java P, get the output, and start debugging and see what's going on. And obviously, there are so many features that I did not show you, but I really encourage you to explore it yourself. It's not that complicated, and it's kind of even fun when you start to understand it. And those are great references that I took for this lecture, which should be also available online. I encourage you to look at them as well. And thank you.